by the way, I'm not even sure raising that much money and doing that many rounds is always the right path for companies. You should be raising at your pace and you should be raising when it makes sense. But what's important is you want your destiny in your hands and you don't want to be you know, going around begging for money in order for your company to survive. That's the worst position you need to be in. I, I never wanted to depend on fundraising. When we raised our seed, we had four point something million dollars in the bank. When we raised our A a year later, I think we had burned like 350k. If you do that, you have better negotiations. You just raise on your own terms. Having every entrepreneur needs to put themselves in this mindset. Welcome to The Peel, where we explore the world's greatest startup stories. I'm your host, Turner Novak, founder of Nana Capital, a venture capital firm with the best deal flow. Today, I'm happy to bring you my conversation with Alex Boisiz, the co-founder and CEO of Deal, which provides HR, payroll, and employee compliance software for global teams. Last week, Deal announced their full-stack HR and payroll product for the U.S. market, but the company didn't start that way. And we'll talk about how Deal used its initial product that helps startups hire international employees and contractors as a wedge to build a global HR platform that now does over $300 million in revenue per year, just four years after they shipped the very first product. Deal is arguably one of the fastest-growing companies of all time, and we'll spend the next hour talking through that journey from zero to a $12 billion valuation. We'll talk about the initial insight that led Alex and his co-founder Shro to start building Deal in 2019, and how they pivoted one week before YC Demo Day. We also discussed why Alex strategically added so many angel investors to the cap table, how his fundraising approach has changed from his C to Series D rounds, why picking board members is a form of marriage, what it means to move at deal speed, and all the lessons learned growing the team from two to 3,000 employees in four years. Thanks to Ryan Hoover for suggesting some great questions, and thanks to Alex for coming on. And now, please enjoy my conversation with Alex Buaziz. Alex, how's it going? Thanks for joining me today. I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So I want to kind of start things off. I told people what deal is. Can you give us a quick one-liner really quick on how it works and what the product is? We basically built full stack HR and payroll for a global team. But you didn't specifically start out that way, right? It started, it was a little bit more niche. Yeah, yeah, we started. So we started coming in 2019. And like the quick background is we're both international people. We wanted to help companies hire the best people in the world. And at the time we were a bit more niche because we figured like, hey, like what do we see people do when they want to hire around the world? And uh, the first thing we saw was engaging them as freelancers for like small missions and things like that. And we wanted to fix that. And then, you know, we did the good old talk to a customer thing and we kind of build a lot of things for our customers over time. And I'm sure we'll dive into this, but yeah, it's been that. Quite the journey. When you first started Deal, you said 2019, or maybe it was 2018 when you were, you know, working through ideas. What was kind of the thinking like around global teams, remote work? What did people think? Was there really like a many businesses that like specifically focused on that? Or did people think you're crazy trying to build this company for remote work? This is 2019. Yeah, but we, we, we ideated for quite a bit. We, we changed the idea quite a bit until I think like a week before Demo Day in 2019. Uh, we, this we went YC. Yeah, why Combinator demo day at the time? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a couple of things. I think you know before deal, there used to be like three ways to hire people internationally. So people used to do it, but just they would either do like contractor hires and like pay them for like PayPal or like Pioneer and transfer wise. So that's kind of shady, sort of. No legitimacy into the relationship, right? Like no contract in place, no like understanding of local laws on the other side. You're just missing the infrastructure that you need to have in order to do the relationship correctly. And like, I mean, who can blame you? Like, how do you expect to know that in France there's 10 yeah. different ways to be a contractor and like you need to verify that? So so that was the first way. The second way was, I don't know if you know about this, but there's like local agencies in country and like you can hire people through that and they take a shitload of money actually. Okay. Plus percent on top of the salary of those people. And Would you say 30, 30 plus? More, I've seen it. I've seen it vary like from like 10 up to like 50 plus percent. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and they would basically hire them locally on like their local agency on your behalf. And then the second one, mm. the third one, which I loved was like, oh, we're going international. What does that mean? We're opening an entity in Ireland and we'll create a thousand jobs. <laughs> 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 that just means you're opening up in Ireland, right? Like that doesn't mean you're going global. Yeah. Uh, it's actually still <laughs> see some companies kind of do that. Like you're just opening up shop in Ireland, which is a great country for very obvious reasons in Ireland as well. We're going global, right? So people always knew like there is amazing people around the world and it's become more and more flagrant as they're, you know, I'm an international student, right? I studied in the US, I studied in the UK, I studied in Israel, right? So I think like there's definitely been a path towards like help, you know, having great people from around the world, having the skill sets and being just as good as your local people. It's just, it was, there was no real like infrastructure to do this the right 
way. And it was just very painful, right? Like, so we just wanted mm-hmm. to build the infrastructure that makes it as easy, because if it's easy, then you might actually consider more of those profiles and therefore give them a lot more opportunities. Yeah. So basically what you did was it was, or it, initially what it was like was using PayPal to pay and probably not being fully compliant fully following every single law in every country or was using an agency that possibly not also doing all the things legally, but also was taking a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, relying on third party local agencies to me is never a smart idea. Like uh, you have no control and you might feel like you're pushing away the responsibility, um, but not really. So like, you know, I think this was also, also, there's a big, big part around this, which is like experience, right? Like when you're hiring people, you want to give them an amazing experience. And those felt like, you know, second class citizen experience right? They just weren't being treated as well as people that you'd hire locally. So, you know, I think there was a form of acceleration right on that front during remote work because now everybody is is working from wherever, from home. Why is that person not being treated as well as the others? And like that was, I think, a pretty big catalyst as well for for deal in general. How did you guys initially settle on that idea? I've heard you say before, you were almost using like blockchain, but it wasn't actually like crypto. Can you kind of explain what you guys were first trying to do to solve this? Yeah, I mean, I I still think blockchain Blockchain's great and crypto is great. We enable, I think, USDC payouts or, or even B2C payouts to change the world of, uh, of payments. So I still think it's it's great. But I think when we started, we, we just had the wrong hypothesis. Like we, our hypothesis mm. was the reason why people don't work together globally is because there is no relationship of trust between the two parties. And we thought very stupidly to some extent, well, what if we remove this, the, the trust and somehow the money gets unblocked when the task is done? Uh, but really, like it was was never about trust. I mean, there's still some parts of it to some extent, but it's less about trust. It's about ease of creating that relationship and doing it right. So initially the hypothesis we had, which could be solved through smart contracts more than like blockchain, etc. Like the idea of like, hey, when this task is fulfilled and deserves payment, pay it automatically. So solving the trust between the two parties is just having the problem set was right the solution was incorrect. Because you were kind of like, once certain tasks are completed or thresholds are met, then the funds are released. We've been work when you're doing like regular work, right? Like, again, it's like, we just had a misjudgment as per like, why are you not working with that person? And if uh, we thought it was trust between the two parties, but clearly when we move towards the compliance around the relationship, the payments, the ease and the, you know, the peace of mind of doing it right. Like, I think this is where we unlocked a lot of different things. And so then how did you get closer to solving the problem? Was it just talking to customers? Yeah, we talked to a ton of customers, but you know, the funny story here is uh, I remember one day, one of our customers like used our platform and we we're still very early. So we we're building things out. So like PayPal had this option of like holding the money until the task is done. So at the beginning, mm-hmm. we we're doing the, the smart contract thing. And then, you know, we start moving to PayPal because we needed some people to actually move the money. Yep. And one of our customers, like I think put into the PayPal thing, like $8,000 plus. Uh, and it was like a friend of mine. Why are you doing this? What is wrong with you? It's so much money. Wait, he said that to you or you said that to him? That to him. I was like, okay. what is money? What is... And, and I think it's actually one of the big realizations of, of deal very early on. Where it's like, he really appreciated because, you know, compliance something you build over time, right? Like we were still very much building the very beginning of deal. Like, and, and actually the thing that he made me realize is like the idea of tying contracts to money. I mean, the same way a smart contract kind of was, right? To some extent, like tying those two things, which are usually very separated. Like you sign a contract with someone somewhere, they sign or whatever. And then at some other point, you pay them in another way. Like the idea of bridging those two things was very appealing to him. And he just gave a good experience to the other person having that security, that platform. And that's when we're like, huh, okay, so you're engaging them, signing the contracts wanting to do the payments. Okay, there's something there. And I think that was uh, the real catalyst for us to go, okay, we've got something that's doubled down and it's built. So it was basically just combining them all together, all the legal compliance and payments kind of. Exactly, one. exactly. Rather than separating all of those things in different places, right? Like bridging everything together. And like, for sure, there was some aspect of them trusting us with that, that amount of money. But still, I think, you know, I think there's, uh, there's something non-trivial in like the way he used the product at the time. And I was like, okay. And so you said it was one of your friends. Was that a lot of the like very first customers like how did you initially get people to use it he was a batchmate at oyc actually okay uh, maybe you know i mean you know smart plug for them uh sansama the not taking up uh, or the i've heard of it yeah. management app yeah very very cool team and very cool product but he, he yeah i mean you know i think early on you got to be within a, some form of community of people that are willing to i mean it's a very great way to penetrate the first market like for us it was like friends like yc companies or things like that i mean generally i think there's a ton there's a ton of ways to generate like your early early customer and to kind of test out your product real quick and for us that definitely helped let's say you have i don't know a couple customers however many you were in 
what was kind of then what you did to, to really kind of double down on growth? Like, were there any channels? I think, you know, for us, we, we've always been very metrics driven. So like, I think being two engineers out of school, right? My co-founder, you should have her on the show. She's more fun than me. Um, <laughs> you know, well, well, maybe a cu- couple months, we'll give people a break from deal. And then once you guys have some cool stuff that happens. Yeah. We're, we're, but, but, you know, we, we're both very engineering. So, like we're both engineers, so, like growth every month. We, we were not looking for hyper growth at the time. We we're looking for consistent growth. Are we consistently bringing in customers that are excited about the product, that see the value? And, you know, at the beginning, we also had a lot of education to do. Like, no, it's not okay to just send some cash to someone somewhere on PayPal. Or tra- like, that education is actually something that, like, today is, like, much more laughable. At the time, people are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's just PayPal. Who cares? <laughs> what do you care? Like, of course. So, I, so there was some education there for sure. And But I think, you know, there was just, like, small things that different people liked within the platform and as long as like we kept on doubling down on those like the payment experience the end user experience the compliance aspect of the relationship different people like the solution for different things at the time and you know actually this product is not the most successful product at the company right like the products we built after are, are more successful but it definitely like geared us towards you know, being very metrics driven and making sure that we keep improving the product and keep having those sales. Like if mm-hmm. you're not going, then you're dead, I think. So like pushing a lot of our custo- uh, our potential customers to see why deal is great has, has always been like a main thing. We're quite go to market led as an organization. We're a compliance product, but go to market too. Uh, we sure actually takes care of go to market. So she's solely focused on that all day, every day. You mentioned doing YC. Some of this kind of pivoting ideation stage, was that during YC, before, after? We actually pivoted into this idea one week before demo day or two weeks before demo day. Did you have one of those nice demo day charts that was like starting to go up? Yeah, definitely. Of course. <laughs> Uh, Revisionist history. You know, it's funny because I still, you know, our, our partner, uh, if you met him, Aaron Harris, he, he was the one that kind of like bet on us. And I remember him looking at me doing the first pitch ever of prep for demo day. And he's like, hey, everyone, they pivoted on Friday. And I was like, shit. Uh, <laughs> But for sure, like we, we definitely, I mean, you know, the thing is like when we had the very initial idea, we had a lot of people interested. So like we had initial traction and obviously there's the story part of fundraising and the storytelling part of fundraising, but like we were excited, right? Because for the whole beginning of YC, and I think most early stage funders are that way, like you lie to yourself a lot. I need to mm-hmm. build that feature, that thing that's going to help me. That's going to solve all the problems. Exactly. But in, in there, like when you have something that feels like it's going to be interesting and it's going to get traction, you kind of feel it. And that's why you get those kind of charts, right? Like, uh, but is that so that's, you know, reassuring yourself that you're actually in the right direction, I think is super important because uh, you have a lot of self doubt and stuff when you're building. So uh, mm-hmm. this, this, this was key for us for sure. How as a founder have you kind of dealt with that? Like self doubt, uncertainty? I mean, first bring it all the question. I'm, I'm always ready. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we are, and it's actually one of our principle, like, you know, we design deal principles uh, similar to a lot of different companies, but very focused on who we are as people and what we want the company to reflect. Uh, we have this idea of being default optimists. A lot of stuff is not going to go your way. A lot of things you can control. Every day is a very different day. And like, as long as you suck it in and just like move forward that I think that works for me. I, I'm, you know, I think em- emotionally, I think I'm able to like say, whatever, like I can control this, it happened, let's move into the next thing. And I think that's that's a very good skill to have. It, it's also very important not to apply this too much in your personal relationships because that one, you know, it's... I yeah, that's I, a good point. <laughs> but uh, but on, on the work front, it's important because... I think it's a skill as a founder that if you don't have, it can be very hard, especially as like, you know, you're on a 10 year plus journey and so many things are going to happen that are gonna, not going to make make you happy in general. And you're going to need to have control on this. Yeah. Have you always had that skill or did you have to learn it? Uh, the thing is, I come from a pre-entrepreneurial family. I think I've seen my mm-hmm. father go through things like this and, and mm-hmm. be able to, I just not have any, I, it never had any impact on my life growing up. So maybe I have it from him, but. Like, I, you know, I think it's it's more education and background. Like, for example, I think being an engineer helps me a lot there where I can like break down the problem and like extract what I think is important versus not and just format it in a way that my brain and I guess even my heart can process it. It's almost like if you just think about it from just a purely numbers perspective or like you said, breaking it down. If you're going to decide to be default optimistic, it's like, OK, something didn't happen, but there's so many other things that are good that hopefully will happen in the future. And- but, but at the same time, I think like for us, we have a like genuine care. It's actually another principle I deal where like we do take things to heart. So, you know, one thing we do is every time someone thinks poorly of the company or thinks poorly of the product, many of our customers, right? Like 
we actually go above and beyond. Like we have a Slack channel at the company where every single review across every single platform comes through. And, you know, you get nice like stars, et cetera. But the, the one stars are the one that like hurt what happens. And we actually have yeah. like a squad of people that are here to fix those things and make sure the experience improves for our customers, make sure we understand so we do better. And I think on that front, you should never be emotionally unattached when it comes to like your customers. That's the reason you wake up every day. You should care about every single thing they say and you should like heavily invest in this. What's a good way to do that? I think this is top down led, right? If you do it yourself, and I still do a ton of that myself, because you know, no product is perfect, no team is perfect. You're gonna mess up. You're gonna have things that are outside of your control. And uh, as, as long as you recognize this, and you just, uh, I think people are quite understanding as well. Like, you know, their own company is not perfect most of the time, right? Regardless of where they work or, or what they do. So, you know, we have this thing called deal speed, which is like very much the one that defines us the most. And what we think about that is like never push things to tomorrow if there's something you can do today just do it today mm. and it even more it's even more important for us because when you work in payroll contracts compliance like someone doesn't get paid at the end of the month like you're not saying hey oh sorry you know it's bank holiday i'll talk to you tomorrow like if you even one day is not okay right like and if you combine like the speed of execution that we want the care that we have for our customers it's just like creates that whole like company culture of being very focused on our customers and i think like if you had if you don't have that in an industry like ours you're doomed i was going to ask ask about this actually about deal speed so i was talking to ryan hoover and he's like i don't know how alex does it i'll text him or email him and he responds in like five minutes how do you do it? I literally have my phone and I respond. It's not, I think deal, so deal being a global company, so we have 3,000 plus people across 100 countries now. I think at the leadership level, what I've seen is that most people, because we give the flex, we have no offices. I mean, we have one tiny one in Germany from an acquisition that we can't really mm. break the lease off. But, uh, you know, technically we don't have any offices. We give WeWork memberships to everyone and they can go into whatever we work they want. They actually go in squads now, which is kind of cool. But I, I think like the default at deal is like you get to manage your time. So like you work from wherever you want, you're in control of your time, you have things in your life and like you need to take care of the things that you want at the right time. And we're a lot more focused on output. And when you do that, then I think the trade-off at least within leadership at the company is that you need to be available, right? Like something goes wrong on the sales side in the US or on customer success side in the US or in APAC. Like I think as a leader, you kind of have to be there. So, I mean, it fits really well, at least with my lifestyle and my mindset today. And it looks cool when Ryan's being science are in two minutes. You mentioned something else there that was really interesting. The squad between the office. What is that? Can you explain? Because we don't have any offices. Well, it's like this guy office. So if you come on deal, you'll have like deal London, deal Barcelona, deal Madrid, deal whatever. And then what we're seeing, which is kind of cool, is we, we give those WeWork memberships to people and they can go to WeWork whenever they want. They're all access pass where it's just like anywhere in the world you can... Exactly. And then you'll be like, oh, I'm going to WeWork's Covent Garden today. And then you'll get like, oh, me too, 60 people in the UK, which is called, they'll all come to the Covent Garden we work today. And like people, you know, they, they love the ability to choose where they work and they love the ability to work with their coworkers. So like giving that flexibility is really fun. And when you get to a threshold where, you know, the other day I was in Florence for some conference and one of my teammates just wrote me, he's like, did I just see you or do you have a twin? <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay, like we're getting to like new levels of org, which is going to go. Cool. How many people work at Deal right now? Uh, I think about 3,000, something like this in a hundred countries plus. So like you pick a place, you'll have a friend. Wow. And you were, you started the company in 2019. Ideation was like 2018, 2019. I think we launched our product officially demo day 2019, whatever that was, like March something, 2019. So going from the two co-founders to 3,000 people in the matter of four or five years, how do you do that and not have things fall apart? Because that just sounds impossible. Like, I'm sure you just ran into a ton of problems. Yeah, I mean, problems are part of the job, right? I think uh, whether or not people are together, you still have a lot of problems. I think a few things, I think we're lucky where, you know, the mission of the company is we want to help hundreds of millions of people get to work for the best companies in the world, regardless of where they're from. And I think it just attracts very specific types of people which are very excited about this. You know, I think in English, it's like second generation immigrants. I think that's how you say it. But like, you know, when your family is had to completely move out for you to have opportunities for their job opportunities and you know, what would their life have been if they would have stayed in their home country with their family if they wanted to 
So I think that, you know, just, it's just very hungry people that want to build a product for like, what, what if, right? And I think that's the first one. The second one is we've been remote first since we've started. So building a lot of like the infrastructure to make people that want to be in that environment as successful as possible is great. And like, if you think about it, if you have some form of product market fit where you can grow and hiring the best talent helps you, the fact that you're not limited to like 30 miles radius around your office to hire the best talent is definitely a huge accelerator. Like you suddenly can hire significantly more people and you get to pick from the word, right? Like, so you get a very big, big sample of people when it comes down to hiring. So I think both of those things definitely help. And then I think the last thing that helps us generally grow fast is I think deal speed applies to what we build. We just build with our customers and we build fast. Mm-hmm. I think our time frame. I think we've got a really great product and engineering team and they just build amazing products really fast and listen to our customers and it's definitely paid off. I think the other thing too that I was just thinking about as you were talking was let's say you have an office and you want to hire more people you're going to hit a limit on that office and you're going to have to open a new office and like I'll talk to a lot of HR leaders or like CEOs and like yeah like we really need to we need to like expand in Utah because we're trying to hire more people there we need to like open a new office in this one country you never run into that just the office is slack and slack and scale and definitely. So you, you don't run into room like capacity issues. People don't love it when I say that. But another thing I think that's very cool about that's that's very useful about not all being in an office together is mm-hmm. you really love your coworkers to some extent. Cause when you're in an office with someone all day, you there's in consciously you start not like things <laughs> here and there. But yeah, when you like fair. Them, you know, at very specific moments of the day, when you get to see them at like the big events or the SKOs you're doing together, like you're super excited to see them rather than like every single day being. Yes, it's true. There's some coworkers you're gonna love and love every single minute of it. But at the end of the day, if you work in a big office, there's like hundreds of people, right? You just have just more camaraderie because you're just spending very specific times together. So you only get the best out of people because you know why would they want to give you anything else when they only see you like 30 minutes each or there? And you probably just have a ton to catch up on too. Like you're just excited to meet eat finally and just share presence with each other. Exactly. You, you nailed it, right? Like you always have stuff to talk about when you don't see each other every single hour of the day. <laughs> well, so then if I'm a if I'm a founder building, scaling, or even not a founder, anyone doing a remote team, what do you think is crucial to get right? Or what are some of the mistakes that people make just structuring these and making sure that everything flows well? I'm not going to talk about all the compliance stuff. From like the people perspective. I mean, it depends on the stage of the company, but my, I think my default mindset personally, Shro and myself, we have a very, like, like our mindset is we trust people by default. I know not everybody has that. And when you trust people, when you're in a remote work environment, like you can't really be thinking, are my teammates working? So if you're focused on output and you default trust people, I think that's the best way to operate. And I mean, you know, if someone doesn't deliver and someone, you know, quote unquote, betrays your trust, then there's just no for the company, right? So, so I think that's, that's the first big thing is, and I know it's hard, especially when you're like a founder early stage to like, let go and truly trust people on different things. I'm still learning myself to let go on a, on a lot of different fronts. That's number one. I think the second thing is you have to be, you have to be thoughtful about how you build your infrastructure from like onboarding expectations, making sure that like even by the way, pre hiring, like you got to set the right expectation in your interview. Mm-hmm. I think all of that so that people that join. It's always hard to know if they're ready for the type of environment that they're going to be working in. But the more you can set them up, the better for sure. And I think the last one is, I think a lot of people are overthinking it. I talk to a lot of CHROs and CFOs around like in office, remote, et cetera. But like, I think we work in an office together. There's 10 floors. You work on floor 10, I work on floor two. We don't really work together, right? Uh, it's basically the same thing as you're working from home and me working from home too. So. I'm usually, I think, think about all my office settings. It's always been just a small team, three to 10 people really at the end of the day. I think three to 10 people is a different story. Like, um, would I love to have every single one of my teammates next to me all day? I'd love to spend time with them all the time, right? It's just pros and cons, right? Like if I would have done that, I would have probably not been able to hire 99% of them and I would have missed out on this talent, right? So like there's a ton of those, you know, pros and cons on like when you're building these type of teams. So I actually had a question about this interview process you guys have. I forget where I heard about it, but you said you specifically interview every employee. You have 3000 people. Is that still true? Are you still talking to every single person? I still up that 500 or 700. Okay. Uh, okay. I still do for a couple of roles. Typically, I get involved in interview processes where I don't think that the team's quality is where it should be anymore. So I'm kind of coming back to reset the bar. But I think in early stages, it's important. First of all, like 
you know, I think people follow people to some extent. So if you're joining a company, it's because you believe in the people that are leading it in the way they see the world, in the way they're building. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to always be super approachable and to, to be able to communicate this vision if you want people to get excited. And if you want people to to really like appreciate the, the, the company and, and the mission of the company. Uh, that's number yeah. one. Second, I think I'm a decent judge of character <laughs> on whether or not you'd be a good fit for the company. And I felt uh, it was it was an important part of the process. And, you know, when I got to a point where I felt really, really confident, again, so I was telling you earlier, knowing when to let go, right? When I felt, when I came to a point where I felt like my team really had a good, you know, hold on that. And when I was basically approving most of the candidates they were sending me, I was like, okay, I'm ready to let go. I think they've done, they're ready. And do you still do deal speed on the interview process? I think I remember hearing you did like four interviews in a day or two. Is that still the process? Just super quick? It's just because it's you, but usually 15 minutes and then I'm not focused anymore. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, no, I'm doing this for, for people. I think um, you, I think you can understand whether or not someone is going to be. Again, you have amazing people. They're just not good fit for you and for the company for the company that you're building and your your team, right? So I think you can know whether or not someone is a good fit within five to seven minutes. And then after that, I just take this as an opportunity for them to to know what they want to know and right ask the right the questions that they think is important. And and hopefully, you know, it doesn't matter if they get the role or not. I just hopefully want them to come out of this with a good experience and for them to be excited and be a promoter of the company regardless of the end of the process. So by now, like I truly rarely pass and candidates. My team's just done a tremendous job at bringing great people and, uh, you know, it's paid off. And then do you guys still do really quick offers and kind of like, I don't know, I guess passes or just super quick through the process? I think it depends on the role. Like there's roles, like leadership roles are a bit different. I think it's important to spend the time with the people and for, you know, we're, we're hiring for a couple like uh, head of, which is our B-rolls basically. At the end. You know, I think it's important to spend the right amount of time. I think the interview process... I think we spend enough time, like five to six interviews is more than enough. It's just the, qu the question is how fast do you move in those in between? And I'm sure that we're a little slower than we used to. You know, probably we need to go check after this interview in. Yeah, and see, you but, uh, <laughs> I think when you are early stage, when you're excited about a candidate, it's important to show that excitement and to, to show the momentum because top talent has a choice and you want them to choose you. Um, so momentum is always key. I wanted to kind of jump back because usually I like to kind of go through history of the company, learn learn all the secrets, which we've kind of we kind of started to skip over a little bit. But so going back, you were in YC, you raised the seed round. I've heard you say you don't think it's a good idea to share a lot of information with investors. Can you explain that? It depends on the scope of the company. When you are coming out of Y Combinator and you are raising your round. And you're very early anyway. Your numbers are way too early. There's no show of traction. Those guys are basically yep. building, like betting on you and the team, I think. And also, I think in this very specific scenario, you have people trying to quickly say no to a lot of companies because they're scared of missing on the other companies round. Like that's kind of like the dynamic of a way coming into the day if you haven't seen that. So. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. I think it's important to keep your cards close to your chest so that you can close your own really fast. I think, you know, as you grow, when you raise your B, your C, your D, yeah, it's an open book, right? People that are investing have a good perception of uh, what we do and how we do it, et cetera. I think this is very, very focused on like raising your first round. And again, it's in a very, very unique dynamic, which is like hmm. demo date and Y Combinator. But yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, if you give too much, there's a lot of reasons to say no. When you're in a seed round, they're not investing truly because of your numbers. They're investing because they think you're building something cool. So don't give them a lot of reasons to say no, ideally. Unless you have yeah. amazing metrics and open your books all the way. But like most companies like us that pivoted one week before demo day, do not have amazing metrics. They have like the beginning of something. Well, so that's an interesting question. I, I didn't think I was going to ask, but what's been the difference on fundraising as a, you know, seed series A company? And now I think the last public number you said was like 295 million in ARR. And this was months ago. So you're probably, you're north of 300, I, I would hope. So then what's the difference been in how you approach fundraising between early stage and later stage? Or maybe another question would be like, how's your strategy personally changed? over the last couple of years as you've kind of grown? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always been the same. It's like, again, first round is very different than the rest. First round, I, I think I remember Michael from YC tell me, 
if anybody's willing to give you money to build your most likely stupid idea, take it. <laughs> just just run and try to build something and say thank you. Something like, you know, that's, that's probably the precedes it round and how I would uh, how we kind of see it. Post that, I think it becomes different. So like for us, it's always been, I, I never wanted to depend on fundraising. When we raise our seed, we had four point something million dollars in the bank. When we raise our A a year later, I think we had burned 350K in a year plus. Uh, so we had infinite runway technically and like could have converged into profitability at the time right so that just gives you a lot of momentum i mean the worst thing you want to be is you know on your back foot saying if you don't race within the next x months you're you're dead so if you do that you have better negotiations and you have you you just raise on your own terms and i think we've done that every single round since then and by the way i'm not even sure raising that much money and doing that many rounds is always the right path for companies right like you should be raising at your pace and you should be raising when it makes sense but what's important is like you want your destiny in your hands and you don't want to be you know going around uh send him roll begging for money in order for your company to survive right that's the worst position you need to be in so being super burn conscious and having every entrepreneur needs to put themselves in in this mindset and then i think you mentioned earlier i was going to ask about this growing 20 percent every single month what's the method to do that how did you think through what was the system you guys put in place i think we we're pretty relentless on that we had to grow this amount so whatever mm -hmm. we needed to do from a customer perspective i remember she was calling cold calling hundreds of customers a day herself and like she would not let that one go i think being very very like conscious about like hey this is what we want to do i think ryan can give you actually some insights on, on that growth from from mm -hmm. the new you know the investor updates he got but we're always aiming for this because if you're not growing then something is wrong right and if something is wrong you better figure it out really fast so being a bit mindful you know sometimes you have off months right but overall you need to be growing i think at that pace specifically you know when you're going from one dollar to two dollars you need to be growing at this 20 plus percent ideally at 100 percent month on month right so if you want to build a big company maybe not monthly for everyone but i think on like a monthly basis you should be growing if not there's some there's something wrong and that's okay it's just maybe a different type of business i was talking to vinay at one of the loom founders he said you are the most sales focused founder or ceo he's like ever met what, what, what do you think that means? I take it as a compliment, I guess. Uh, I think, I mean, what he means is I'm very genuine in my relationships, always. But at the same time, I'm always a bit annoyed when my friends or people around me that I like don't use deal. I always like remind them that uh, it's not so cool. They should. So you just try to slide it into everything that you do. You're always, always selling. Always, always. I need to slide it. But it's, it's more like, I, I mean, I, lo I love working with people and I, work, I love them being customers. I love them being feedback. Yeah. It's one of my favorite relationships. If you look at like my WhatsApp, I have a hundred plus of our customers on it where they're mm -hmm. sending me feedback all the time and they're talking to me. And I, I think, you know, my, my friends should better, they better be customers. If not, I'm doing something wrong. If my product's not good enough for my close friends that are running companies to use it, then shit. <laughs> You guys did the the demo day seed round. This was was this 2019 or was this 20 winter 2019? Yeah, you said you raised your Series A right before COVID hit. Was this like January ish? No, something like March. So COVID would have hit like a weeks later. Yeah, but I don't think it was yet at the state. I don't remember the exact timeline. To be honest, I'm getting old. I think it was more or less exact at the same time. So you basically had this product that was just ready to serve the world when when COVID broke out. I mean, we spent a year building, so definitely had a much better product than a year before. <laughs> definitely had invested a lot on the compliance infrastructure, which definitely helped us quite a bit. But yeah, I mean, we were in a good place. And I think we were getting to a point, and I think that's actually the reason we raised that round even. We're getting mm -hmm. to a point where we were moving from too many inbounds, too many demos. So you start moving from a funders led motion towards like, what if we add someone to help us? There is mm. some repetitiveness to what we're doing, which is great. That means you can teach it to someone. Maybe it's time for us to bring on people and start scaling this. And I think, you know, you always have inflection points at the company and that felt like a very strong inflection point where like, okay, maybe time to also raise money so that we're in a better place. And, you know, the people that at the time gave us our, our term sheet were, were good people. So we're like, you know, it's, it, it looks like everything is falling into places. Let's let's do it. You did the Series A from A16Z, and they were the only real firm you were really keeping close. Well, I had a few other term sheets at that time because you know you have an A16Z term sheet. You get a couple others. I actually don't think A16Z was the first term sheet either. I think we had another mm. one. I think they were keeping more tabs on us. To be honest, I think they were keeping tab on the market. They had a market thesis at the time, and they actually were looking at one of our competitors at the same time. Uh, if I, I mean, they told me that at the end of the process. Uh, if 
I remember correctly. But yes, like they were, I had a good relationship with Anish. I think, you know, he's my board member. Um, so today he's really great. And I think he, he appreciated the, the market. And if you have a market this is and you've done work before, then, you know, it's a lot better than companies come, you know, funds coming in blind, just trying to throw a term sheet at you because you have another. I mean, it's a long-term relationship. You want someone who's fully on board. And Anish has been on our board for the last three plus years. He's seen a lot and he's been super supportive. So definitely need to pick the right way. I've, I've seen, I've seen relationship go sideways with board members and it's not pretty. It's a long-term relationship for sure. And like, you know, deal has gone faster than I think most companies. So, you know, technically in non-deal years, it could have been a couple more years already, right? You need to pick your board members really. It seems like a light engagement, but it's a form of marriage. <laughs> so you need to pick it wisely. I mean, what do you think are the most things to prioritize when you're picking a board member? Really depends on your stage. There's a couple of things. The first one, I would always reference check before taking any term sheet, any board member, because it's really helpful to hear from people. Actually, uh, A16 did a good job at that. They put me in front of people that both had bad experience from a company perspective and like how were they as board members when the company didn't go well versus going well. And obviously do your own reference check as well. But I think depends on the stage, depends on like how much value they're going to bring. You know, it's hard for someone that's sitting on a board meeting every quarter to truly have an impact on your company, right? So like, I think you need to have people that have experience working in your field that have seen one of the things that I'm, I'm lucky enough to get to work with, with Ben at home is like one of the things that's magical about working with him is you just tell him your headcount and he tells you the problems you have and he's freaking accurate about it every time, right? And I think, you know, being able to have those people that can truly help you solve those problems because of pattern recognition or uh, be there for you when things don't go well is super important. So, mm -hmm. you know, the worst thing you could have, the worst thing, but like the, the last thing you want is a board member that's absent or even worse, a board member that can have negative impact on the company, which is like the one big no-go in my opinion. Did you make any mistakes in terms of how you approach that initially? I don't think I thought too much at the time. I think I was just happy that mm -hmm. someone wanted to give me money. I just got really lucky. Uh, and the people that I have uh, were great. I could have definitely made the wrong choices. You talk to someone two, three times, like it's not technically the best way to have a 10 plus years relationships. I think I got really lucky on that front. Maybe I would have done a bit more due diligence, but at the same time, you know, you're building a company, someone's willing to give you 10 plus million dollars at a good valuation. You know, it's tempting. Can't really blame young yourself and, you know, it worked out for, for him. So it's fine. I'm thinking maybe alongside Zoom at the time, it was probably one of like the quickest, fastest needed products in like in the world i think we raised most of our money if not all without having met i think i met anish once for 20 minutes in a coffee like in 2019 september i think every single other run we raised was fully on zoom so like uh maybe yeah you know, again i would i wouldn't change it for the word but uh yeah. you know, maybe i would have thought a bit more at the time i should have thought a bit more at the time but i think you know for us it worked out amazing because our, our board members are great and we learned a lot from them so like you know Lucky. You raised the Series B a couple months later, just later in the summer. Yeah, like three months later. Uh, I guess me and other board member DM me on Twitter and basically gave us a term sheet like a week later. So it was uh, the first one I've ever seen. But it was, again, it was like, a, again, great price, great board member, very ambitious, uh, you know, very happy to have her on the board and she's been great. And you didn't really burn that much money, it sounds like. Why, why did you raise money? Like you could still own 100% of the company or 80% or whatever. I mean, you know, you can't really predict the future. You know, the valuation was good. The dilution was low. More cash in the bank as we're thinking about taking over a big market. We're pretty aggressive. You can do a lot of what ifs with those things, right? And I think, you know, I think deal, the reason why deal is what it is today is because, you know, Yes, uh, yes, I mean, giving us the Series B got YC and A16Z more excited eventually to the Series C, right? Made us more confident to go hard, more aggressive on sales or on some different things. So it's very hard to know. But, you know, again, like today, I'm very happy with my ownership of the company. I'm very happy of the direction of the company. So like uh, definitely no regrets on that. Front. And then so with the Series C, that was, I'm trying to remember, that was like a year or something after the Series B. Series C was in May, a year later, like May. 2021, okay. I want to say. Yeah. And that was led by A16Z, I mean, led by Y Combinator Growth and A16Z together, call it it. And uh, that was our actual our unicorn run. Basically, you were just like, we're raising money to do some acquisitions. Did that happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you still so, have done some acquisitions, right? We were raising, we did, but we wanted to do one very specific one that didn't work mm -hmm. out. But my okay. board was kind enough to still make that run happen. Uh, we tried really hard at the time. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. they probably regret 
that not happening. But uh, no, I, yeah, look, you need to make sometimes some moves. And actually, that's actually a good learning. Like having investors in that case, like A16Z, that have deep enough pockets to follow you on like a potential big acquisition like this is very important. Because like if you're working mainly with smaller investors, which are amazing early stage. If you want to go out and like do those kind of big things, you need to have the big guys on board to make it happen. And like having A16Z at the time definitely helped a lot. And you said that was like an accident that you just happened to have an investor that had really deep pockets or did you think about that a lot no i realize it and i'm happy it happened and i'll you know i'll say it as like a good advice which is like well think about it you want to make that acquisition happen you have your insiders with enough money to make it happen great you want to go and make it happen no one has enough money to make it happen you need to go and start pitching the company and they never know if you don't have a relationship they don't know who you are they need to review the whole business like it's the grind so it was definitely a big advantage for us for sure and I know you've said too before that you've really thought it was a good, it was a smart move to have a lot of angels on board early on. It's not nothing specifically new, but I think early stage, when you're an early stage founder, there's so many of them. Like, uh, I think people wanting to spend time with you is, a, you know, social capital of theirs and mm-hmm. a way to make them great, like excited is for it to be, you know, a lot of people pay it forward, but if they have own equity in your company, they care more, right? And I think the more people you have that care about your company, the more chances you get to build a relationship with them. And I'm actually staying right now in London in one of my amazing investors place because I'm staying here for two days for work. And like, you know, that relationship on, is an amazing guy. Deal is how we got to know each other truly because, you know, there's so many amazing people that you could be meeting. Like, why us? Why me? Right. And like, I think it helps in so many different ways. And you just need to value that into your equation when you're, when you're fundraising. And I genuinely think that the more people want you to win that are you know important, the more likely you are to win in general when your company gets bigger. So when I see all these announcements like deals launched in APAC or you're in whatever country, what does that mean? Because your product is already sort of global. Like, does that mean you launch an office or you're serving end customers that are in that market? Yeah, I just a couple of different things. So so we have, uh, we've certainly, like you said, we're already global. We have infrastructure in every country. We've been working on yep. it for a long time. We're building out infrastructure from a sales team, from a customer success team, from a customer support team, from all of the different ones to truly serve local customers. Um, so that's what we kind of say. It's like, hey, we now have a country leader. The country leader is here to make things happen here as a face and as a representative of the country to push things forward. We feel comfortable with the infrastructure that we've built there from like a a people perspective, we're now even more ready than before to take on the world in that region. That's how we kind of see it. And I think it resonates with the market quite a bit. How do you decide which new market to like lean into next? I mean, candidly, it's where our sales grow the most, right? If there's a lot of interest and if the initial salespeople and the sales organization that we have and the customer base grows really rapidly, then I mean, there is more support required and therefore we invest more into the country. So it's a pretty simple equation for us. And I think there's yeah, some markets that are a bit more complex than others where like it doesn't like you need to go into it with the right infrastructure straight away. Like I think, for example, Japan is a very tough market, but it's such an mm-hmm. amazing market where you know, there's not as many engineers as in like it to be. So if you want to hire mm-hmm. the top engineers and being able to lean into other regions in Asia is, is a big thing, right? So I think some markets mm-hmm. are a bit different than others on that front. But, you know, you look at your customer base, how excited are people for the product mm-hmm. and then you double down on the region. If you could go back early days of deal, anything you'd do differently? Or maybe not early days, maybe it was last week, but anything you do different? I think there's a couple of different things. I think the first one, there's definitely a couple of people that uh, I should have fired a little faster because they had an mm-hmm. uh, impact on the company that, uh, you know, as a, as a, I wouldn't say first time founder, but like first time founder of a company that's more than five people. So five. Yeah. Uh, I think there's definitely a couple of things I learned there. The second thing is always like the same, right? For example, when we started at Deal, on the independent contractor side, we built a full infrastructure in-house. On the employee side, we started by leveraging local partners and aggregating them because we're like, okay, are we going to open 120 entities? That might be a bit complicated. And, and you know, th- there actually was two different players in the market, one that did it all in-house, one that used only uh, aggregated all of those. And we're like, hmm, okay, aggregation seems to be like the faster way to do it. And mm-hmm. three months into that, we realized, we don't control compliance. It's we're relying on those local agencies. Like you said earlier, like we don't know if they're doing things right. And most of the time, they actually don't do things right. We can control the customer support experience, the customer success experience, if it's not our entity, our own things. And we pivoted straight into like, okay, no, that's not going to work. Like it's not to the level of what we want to provide to our customers. Let's open our full infrastructure. Maybe we would have done it like this earlier because I think the lap of creating... Earlier on, I think creating our entity versus using the partner, like 
some people and it took us a bit of time to rectify this like thought, oh yeah they're an aggregator at the time so now we fully rectify it and everybody knows like we actually have the biggest infrastructure there i think maybe doing that differently maybe would have, i would have done it straight away and obviously i think i would have even like shifted like if you think about a product roadmap there's a couple products that are significantly more successful than our first one we at the very beginning we didn't want to get into those markets because of focus realizing how much more successful they are like mm -hmm. maybe we would have shifted that a little bit and do it earlier and i think you guys launched a really cool product recently it was an immigration support product. Can you kind of explain that? Yeah, we have a ton of products. Okay, so like I'm very excited. Okay. Um, so immigration for sure. So we acquired a company called LegalPad. Um, we actually did my my own O1 when uh, I moved to the US for YC. And basically, what we realized is like as you help a lot of companies go global, immigration becomes a huge topic, right? You want to hire that person in that country. They're on a visa. What do you do? You want to move someone from one country to another? How do you, what do you do? And like we realize immigration is such a key part of the deal, and it's like such a in my opinion, like so tied to the mission of the company. We want to help you hire people from all around the world, give them an amazing experience and help them move to the country of their dreams if this is what they want to do, right? So immigration is a big thing for us, but we're also doubling down on our US core offering because now that we've become so good at global, we have like this unique opportunity of full consolidation where you can do everything in one platform because like on the global side, we're very hard, very hard to catch up on, right? Like we've built so much. We have a lot of things productized, like going back into like full HR and US, et cetera, and doubling down on this so that you have one system for everything is a very unique opportunity. And, you know, our market is like very exciting. Like, you know, we launched our HR product, our US PEO product, our US payroll embedded product, and like all of those things are like, that is super important for early stage founders in the US as well, because how you start your company, but like fringing payroll HR, full global, same, ex like good, amazing experience in the US, but amazing experience in, in outside of the US as well in one place is something that the market hasn't seen. So you basically went from being a way to support an international team to suddenly it's like just full stack HR, anything you need to pay people, benefits, et cetera. Exactly. So like when we started, we we're like contractors internationally, then employees where you don't have entities internationally. Then we started doing payroll for where you have your own entities. And we realized, wow, okay, now everyone's getting paid free deal. What if we become the source of truth as well from an HR standpoint? And we have so much learnings, right? From like global, like no, if you think about HR software, it's always hyper local, right? Like I'm solving mm -hmm. for the US, I'm solving for the UK for friends. But like we had the like global angles straight up and we were just, hmm, we can bring, like think about time of policies, like there's different time of policies based on the worker type, based on the countries that you have. And like, we feel it because we help companies hire that way. Bridging like HR and all of this payroll for the first time was a big deal. And then just taking all of this, that was earlier this year and taking all of this mm -hmm. and saying, and now we're going to be the best one in the US market as well. So you have everything in one place is, I think, a pretty big and, and unique opportunity. So you can essentially have employees, every single country, you can hire someone in Romania, move them to the US pay them benefits. Do you have retirement plans yet? Is that coming? Everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to help you run your US team. I'm going to help you run your Philippines team, your Japanese team all in one place and make sure that if one day you want to move that French person to France, to the US or Canada, we can make it happen too. Wow. That's amazing. And then I think you guys also just announced, hopefully we get the timing on this, right? Like an HR AI assistant. Yeah. I'm so excited about this. Actually, every quarter... I take one team under me directly. And actually that one I've kept for a bit longer. Um, so I've had it for the last six months. Basically, like if you think about deal, we have so much knowledge, right? Like employment, uh, compliance everywhere, benefits everywhere, taxes everywhere, maternity leave policies, et cetera. Like all of this, we, we built our own inner wiki for it. And we built like something really like substantial. And we realized... Oh, okay, like all our people are like looking for this data to answer our customers, to answer our sales conversation. What if we layered like good old open AI or, or, or like, you know, a strong, a strong product on top of this so that we can truly leverage what we've built. And what we've built is like 250 plus compliance people in-house, like lawyers internally in countries, payroll managers in countries, local HR in countries. What if we layered on that content, like an ability for you to be able to ask any questions you want related to your HR workforce or related to global employment and all of the things together. And I mean, I'm super, I use it all day. For example, you can go and say, what's the employer cost in France? And you get a full breakdown and fully parameterized. So like when it changes in a year, then you'll be fully updated as well. And you can even compare the history. Or what is the paternity policy in Ukraine? Like whatever that may be, just being able to do that at your fingertip rather than like ask our, ask our support, ask our success team is like super powerful. And I think the other thing which is super important is like internal alignment. I think a lot of companies suffer from this. Just when you have like a wiki that you're looking at internally, 
And I think a couple of companies are trying to solve this right now, but like you search in a different way than I search. Therefore, sometimes we don't find the same answers. Right? And then, you know, when you're talking about such sensitive topic, like termination of a person in a country or things like that, like you need to give accurate answers. So by doing that, we're just making sure that we're channeling and we're like making sure that we synthesize the right answers across all of our organizations. So our customers can be super happy. And yes, like you said, we've worked on it for like so long and now it's actually going to be customer facing as well, not just internal. Mm-hmm. So it's really Wow. So that's, that seems like an anomaly. I feel like you guys, you move really quick on stuff. Why did it take so long to build that one out? Because of privacy data and privacy of accounts. Mm. The current infrastructure is not ideal when it comes to this. So we had to do a lot of work in the background. And again, also because of sensitivity as well, right? Like when you're looking at this type of data, you want to make sure you give the right answer. Like I would hate to tell you, oh, you can just terminate that person in that country like this. And it doesn't actually happen. Uh, and, you know, we're a global team, GDPR, <laughs> making sure that we do things the right way. That's true. With whole new complexities. Uh, so yeah, we, we really spent time on this because we started wanting to make it great internally. And when we felt really, really positively and strongly about it, that it was going to serve our customer well and make sure that data, privacy, everything is done the right way, we could make it customer facing. Okay. Well, I guess I'm curious. Do you have a favorite founder or CEO or business, just like any period in time that you really look up to or get a lot of inspiration from? There is definitely a couple I love. I don't know if you know Arik from a company called Rapid in Israel, um, 15 plus billion dollar company. Great guy, super sharp. And if you know Sebastian from D Local, public company. D Local, yep. They're what, payments in Latin America? Yeah, in Latin America, I think he's okay. an awesome founder. So, what, what do you like about these guys? A lot of grit, you know. We live in a market that's very tough. Running these type of companies is very hard. Mm. And you can look through, for example, the locals history. Like there's a lot of people trying to, without, I mean, I, I don't know exactly the details, but without truly understanding what they're doing, trying to give mm. them a shit left and right. And uh, mm. I think just the, the mental fortitude of being able to build such companies that are successful. And I, I think that's crazy with the margin as well, which is super impressive. It's just, you know, those are people, there, there's so many others like Fuji from Instacart and others that like, Whenever I have a problem, I feel very comfortable just saying like, what would you do there? And like they all lived through it. And there's no one better than someone that has lived through things to tell you what they would have done different. And, yeah. and it's being very applicable because your investors, your friends, they, they're not operating the same way you are. They've probably like have kind of seen it, but not as closely as you. As you. So they're not truly in your shoes. And the only way to, to have a real unbiased, hey, this is what happened. This is how I would have done it differently, like heart to heart is mm. is by having the, you know, friends that have lived through things. How do you meet people like that? Like, how do you find a mentor? Social capital, get them to invest in your company. That's a great way to build a relationship. Time back to the earlier question. So angels, you think are, it's just so undervalued? I think angels are like, again, like I, that's why operators are to me the best angels because depending on the stage of the company, depending on what you're seeing, like there's so many things that are, you know, you can just map them one to one, right? And you can pattern recognize angels for sure. And I think eventually those people, just as much as you are looking, when you get to that stage, they're looking for other people that are living through those things. Like it's just mm. good to have people you can talk to as you're building things like this. Most of the time they're like super nice, very down to earth and trying to just figure their shit out day in, day out. And it's just, you know, they're, they're, they value their time and it's, you know, it's hard at this stage to build strong bonds and connections. So like you, I think going through things that are tough, like building a company uh, definitely connects people together. Last question. I've been asking this one a lot lately. Do you have any questions for me at all on anything? Let me think. Uh, I, I love your, I love your Twitter. So I think I, I might have a couple. Where, where do you want to go? Like, you know, I'm seeing a lot of different like places around your social and some of the things that you told me earlier on, I don't know if I can talk about it, that you're working on, like it's quite different paths to me. What like, it's just fun or do you have like uh, a master plan of how all of those things work together? <laughs> yeah, I would say there's a very faint master plan, but I'm not really tied to it because nothing ever really goes the way you think it will. So I guess when I kind of think about the evolution, it was like I started tweeting a decent amount, like blogging, newsletter, now the podcast, I think is just like all these different sort of content channels. Like you kind of take a content first approach to it, to, to venture, just to meeting, meeting founders. Uh, and then, I don't know, I guess I've kind of accidentally built a media business too. So it's kind of figuring out how all these things tie together. I really like investing. Like that's the main thing. And I feel like founding a, a venture firm is not the same as founding a startup, but maybe you can sympathize with 
smaller scale problems that are not not quite the same, but it makes it a little bit more relatable, I think. Right. I mean, you know, I, def- I think a lot of creating your community, creating like, your mark, your customer base, you know, they can be SaaS customers or they can be end users or like, you know, taking on your content and loving your content. So I think that definitely makes a lot of sense. And uh, maybe instead of a venture firm, you can build a, a fun business out of it. Yeah. I mean, both. I mean, it's a new, new type of venture firm. I don't know. But I just think for me, I'm a, I take myself very seriously, but I'm not a serious person, if that makes sense. Like I'm very intentional and serious, but like, I'm okay having fun. So when you talk about like Twitter, I don't know, just having fun out there, I don't take myself too seriously. You're definitely making me laugh. So maybe I can pick up a couple of things from you and try to, try to have fun as well there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, this has been great. Thanks for coming on. Of course, of course. Thank you for listening to me for an hour. That must have been tough. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, I think it was good. I think people liked it. Thanks for tuning into the PL. If you want to support the show, the best ways as always are to leave a review wherever you're listening, like, comment, subscribe, follow, share, and listen to every single episode on every platform multiple times. If you don't want to miss an episode, subscribe to the newsletter in the show notes and you'll get new ones in your inbox the moment they drop. Thanks again to Alex for coming on and thank you for tuning in. See you next time.